Okay. Yeah. And how did you meet the Mink family? I just, I emailed Wendy Mink. So I did a lot of research on my own before even reaching out to her. Um, I read what I could about Patsy Mink on the online. I found a couple of like mini biographies that had been written about her. Um, but at the time, this was back when I started the project in 2004, there hadn't really been a lot written on her. She had passed away two years earlier. So her death was still fairly recent. Um, so I found like a, a little, like kind of a, a book aimed at young adults um, about her. I found, like I said, a mini biography that I think was at the, in the UH Law School Journal. Um, and so I had to do a lot of my own primary research. Uh, I ended up going to Washington DC to look at her papers, which were still being processed at the Library of Congress. Um, they're, I believe they're all processed now. So any, any researcher can go to the Library of Congress and, and look through her papers there. Um, but I was kind of doing it as they were processing it. And I mean, that was sort of exciting, but they were still trying to figure out what, what was in there. And she kept a lot of materials. There's a lot of written documents. A lot of the photographs are from her papers um, as well as from her family. Uh, so yeah, I did a lot of research and of course started talking to people who worked for her, who worked with her, family, um, extended family. So most of the research was looking at archives as well as doing a lot of interviews with people. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us more about her relationship with Maui and where she grew up? Um, Sure. Um, I have that song Maui Girl in there because I was told by the people who knew her that really Maui was always something she carried in her heart. Uh, she grew up in, uh, on a sugar plantation uh, in Maui near Paia. She went to Kamakuapoko Elementary School and then to Kaunoa English Standard School. So she grew up in, in a plantation setting um, where I think that really informed who she became and her ideas about society. Um, she saw, you know, segregation. She saw that her father who had a college degree as an engineer, um, but who kept getting passed over for jobs uh, by less educated, you know, less experienced white men. Um, so she saw the injustice, but I think she was also very optimistic. Um, you know, in her early childhood, she would talk about just really enjoying running around the outdoors. She did a lot of reading, which I think really expanded her worldview. And then her family would listen to like FDR's fireside chats. Um, they went to election rallies. Uh, so I think civic participation was just something that she kind of grew up with and really believed in, um, really believed the importance of being an a active citizen. Um, you can even see it in school. She was very active in a lot of clubs. Uh, her senior year, she ended up running for student president and won and was the very first uh, female student president of Maui High School and also the valedictorian. So, I mean, I think this, uh, this sort of theme of her, you know, um, being very active, participating and trying to change things started very, very young for her. Oh, I think, sorry, Beth, I think you're muted. <laughs> sorry. That's One okay. of the things um, we discussed with you was um, thinking about, you know, Patsy, what made her tick? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I spent four years trying to answer that question. And of course, I can't answer it fully. I'm not her. Um, and maybe different people have different perspectives. But I talked to a lot of folks. I mean, I think a lot of things made her tick. I think she, what she really, I think, was trying to do throughout her life was trying to hold America accountable to its ideals. I think she really believed in the ideals of America, of equality and equal opportunity, um, but realized that that wasn't always true. You know, um, it was the day after her 14th birthday that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And she would tell the story, um, it's, it's in the film about seeing her, her father burn all of these things he had from his parents and from his family, anything that connected him to his Japanese heritage. And that I think left an indelible mark on her. Um, her Japanese language teacher was taken away, um, I believe interned. So um, I think 
forgot where I was going with this, but, you know, she, she really wanted there to be um, equality. And, and anytime she saw that that wasn't happening, she didn't just let it happen. She, she, you know, took action. So whether, I mean, when she was young, she just saw things happen, but you could see her getting more and more involved. So when she's at the University of Nebraska and put into segregated housing herself, she starts a letter writing campaign, right? Um, when she comes back from law school to practice law in Hawaii, and I don't think this is in the film, um, you know, or maybe it was, but she uh, was not allowed to at first because she was married at the time and Hawaii had a domicile law on the books, which said that a woman, a married woman carried the residency of her husband's state. And since John Mink was from Pennsylvania, she was seen as a Pennsylvania um, resident. So she was not allowed to practice law in Hawaii. So she protested it, right? She didn't just say, okay, I'm not gonna do it. She, she challenged that, that law and it was eventually struck from the books. But um, so you can see this sort of, her beginning to challenge the status quo. And I think that's something obviously she did in Congress and throughout her life. So I think what, I guess going back to your question what made her tick was, yeah, she, in a way she was a real idealist, but she also was willing to put, um, put into action, you know, work toward changing um, society to meet the ideals that it um, held up. And then, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And then I also just wanted to note, I mean, her family was really important to her. So I think that was also part of, of who she was, um, was, you know, the, the, the values that were instilled. Her, her parents, she would tell the story about how her parents treated her and her brother very equally. Um, so within the family, there was, you know, she had a lot of opportunities, but just seeing that in society, there were these institutional barriers. So um, kind of wanting to change that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I wrote down some notes while I was watching, but you know, the being morally right and being the voice of conscience in, in Congress. Um, so we have one question. Well, and there's comments from people who um, they remember their parents supporting Patsy, um, feeling, sensing, uh, getting a, a feeling of um, pride and loss when she passed away um, from the film. Um, and so there's one question, um, what would Patsy Mink think of the anti-Asian violence today? Yeah, well, again, I'm not her, but I think she would be very um, upset, concerned. She would be doing what she could um, to raise awareness of this probably even before you know what happened last week. Um, probably from the beginning of the pandemic, when we were starting to see, you know, President Trump calling it the China virus and things like that, she would have called him on those kind of things for sure. Um, so I think she would be very outspoken, right? I mean, this is not new. Um, maybe it's becoming more vocal now. Um, but, you know, this country has had anti-Asian sentiment and anti-Asian violence from, you know, early, early on, you know, from transcontinental railroad time. So I think Patsy knew her history and she knew, you know, these kind of things repeat themselves. And she was someone who wanted to um, create change, but I think she also knew that change happened incrementally and um, yeah, I mean, she, she was very inspired by the civil rights movement movement in the 1960s, um, women's movement in the 1970s, you know, this is, this is the same, it's just, you know, focused on Asian Americans, but this idea of, um, you know, putting, putting people down and treating people differently, you know, all of, all of those things, those were things that she dealt with in her life. So I think she'd be very outspoken about it and very upset about it, as, as many of us are. Um, thank you. So um, another question, um, what was left out of the film? Oh, a lot. <laughs> so um, 
I wanted this to be a film for public television and some of the uh, early monies I got were public television related money. So I knew it had to be a broadcast hour, which is 56 minutes. Um, if I were to do the film again today, I might have done a feature length, but this is my first film out of grad school. So I didn't really wanna have to do a feature length and also try and cut it down to an hour length, which a lot of filmmakers do. But I was just like, okay, I'm gonna just do the hour length. So I, I had to cut out a lot right? Um, you know, you have a whole life. There's no way to condense a life into 56 minutes. So I had to make choices. Um, you know, I, I did focus, you know, I tried to focus a bit on her early life to kind of show you sort of why she did the things she did, why she was passionate about it. Um, but there was more in her childhood I would have wanted to include. Um, I didn't really include any of her constituent work, you know, the things she did for, for the people in Hawaii, um, which would have been nice to include. But again, I, I knew that I wanted this for a national audience. So I was always sort of keeping that in mind. Although I knew Hawaii audiences would obviously be interested and should watch the film and know about her. But um, yeah, so it was kind of, it was hard to sort of balance that. Um, and then also her, her work, you know, she's known for Title IX, she's known for her work on gender equity, but, you know, her work spanned, we went beyond that, you know, she, she was um, protesting nuclear testing in the Pacific early on, she filed a lawsuit that sort of became one of um, the precedents for the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, there's all these other things that she did. She really rallied for things related to women's health and early childhood education, which I, I didn't really get to put in the film. So um, yeah, a lot, <laughs> but I tried to um, put in what I thought captured, you know, her spirit the most and, and told and told the story that, you know, I thought was the story I wanted to tell about her. Well, I think you, you struck a good balance. Um, a question from the audience. There was a lot of archival footage of Patsy. Was it difficult to find them? Um, are they scattered around yes. the country? Yes, <laughs> both and both. Um, yeah, so the, it was a historical biography, right? I, I started the film after she passed away, so I didn't have the benefit of filming, of interviewing her myself. And I knew the film was gonna rely on the archival record. So early on, I was starting to look for archival. Um, and like I said, I went to the Library of Congress where her papers are. So, you know, she kept her own archival record. But in terms of photographs and especially motion picture footage, you know, film footage, there wasn't a lot. I mean, I think I found most, most of what I found is in the film um, and was from different sources. Unfortunately, I really thought there'd be more on Hawaii, but I was told that in the sort of move from film to video, a lot of the TV stations in town threw out their old film footage. So basically anything prior to the early 1980s, like I couldn't find anything locally of her. Um, things after the 80s, there, there, were, there was video and television news footage of her. So a lot of the things you see in her early tenure in co Congress were from national sources. They were from a little bit from NBC News archives, um, some things from Oregon Historical Society, like all the things related to her run for the presidency, um, little bits here like BBC Motion Gallery. So yeah, I kind of like scoured all the archives and, and searched her name. And then also I had to also look for just contextual footage. So footage that wasn't of her specifically, but of the times um, to kind of help situate her within, within the times and places where she lived. So yeah, it was, it was that was the, the biggest challenge probably. And it, it usually is for a historical film is, is the archive. Cause that's what, you know, as a filmmaker you don't really have control over. So you just have to do a lot of searching and digging. Definitely. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, Congresswoman Mink worked on local issues on behalf of her district and national issues as well. Do you think she was perceived differently on the continent versus here at home? Did those different constituencies have different expectations of her? And if so, how did she balance that? Yes, very astute. I think so. I mean, I think there are a lot of people here in Hawaii who really loved her, but as the film showed, she wasn't necessarily embraced by her own Democratic Party here um, and maybe was more embraced nationally um, in some ways in that sense. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think there's just more power struggles here, um, particularly with sort of like the Burns faction. Um, 
And how did she balance that? I think she, you know, she just had to stick to her ideals. She gained, you know, she got strength from her family and from her supporters and always, you know, knew that there were people out there who believed in her and who wanted to support her and did support her. And, and I guess that's where she got her strength from. But she knew in politics that everyone's going to like you or agree with you. So I'm sure it hurt personally at times, but um, as you can see, she was pretty resilient. Um, but yeah, I mean, in some ways she was potentially more embraced outside of Hawaii. I mean, I think she was embraced here. I don't want to say that, but like you, you know, people embraced Inouye and Spark and it's like people didn't embrace her quite in the same way as they did with the others. So whether that's sexism or just because she had such a strong independent streak, um, you know, she was less inclined to bow to party leadership or to ask permission of party leadership like maybe other people would be. Um, she was a bit of an outsider. I think that's sort of, I guess what I'm saying is like, I, I did see her as a bit of an outsider within her own Hawaii Democratic Party. Yeah, a lot of the, um news articles you highlighted were negative. And I mean, that was my impression of her. I grew up, you know, 60s, 70s, I mean, 70s, I should say. And um, that was my impression just from the media, right? But anyway, yeah. um, another question in post-war Hawaii, wasn't Hawaii ruled by um, American or Japanese American vets? How did she relate to their attempts to remake society in Hawaii? to make it a more equitable society. Yeah, I think she she joined in with them. She was part of that democratic revolution, right? And she believed in it, but she was one of the few women who were actually a part of that. Um, so again, a bit of an outsider. Um, it was kind of an old boys network, old boys club, or I guess more young, maybe they weren't all, or weren't all necessarily old at the time, but um, she was she was a part of it, but not right again. That sort of outsider status. Um, I don't. I'm not sure if you noticed. How did Patsy and John Mink handle childcare while they were both working or campaigning? Yeah, that would probably be a better question for Wendy Mink. But I believe <laughs> they just brought her with them. <laughs> I, I mean, I think Wendy would say she was very involved. Um, she was there right along with them for a lot of the things. I'm not sure when she, when Wendy was very, very young, I'm not exactly sure, but I know probably once Wendy was, you know, a tween, a teen, she was, she was right there. And, you know, Patsy had, you know, a, a good support network too. So I don't know for sure, but she has a large extended family. Perhaps she had help from them. Um, if you could interview Patsy in person today, what would be your first question to her? Oh my God, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good one. I've never, I must have thought of that at some point in the making of the film. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the first question that pops in my head is like, what, what made her keep going? You know, like, how do you keep going? through the losses, through, you know, being treated like an outsider. Um, like, where does that inner strength, inner core come from? Kind of maybe going back to your question of what made her tick. But I don't know that we all are so self-aware of that we understand why we, what motivates all of us. But yeah, I think, I think that, I mean, that's what I really, in learning about her story, I, I really admired that part of it, just um, her resilience. Um, was Ulu Ulu Moving Picture Archive a good resource for video? Um, it didn't exist when I was doing the film. Um, I probably have to check the website, maybe I'm wrong, but I was, I was working on the film 2004 to 2008. So Ulu Ulu is where the film is stored now. So it's a great resource and um, not just the film, but all of my footage. So I think it's open to researchers. So if you wanna see um, like the interviews that I did for the film, you could find them there. Sorry. Uh, would you agree Patsy Mink was ahead of her time? Yeah, I, I made that the film title. 
<laughs> well, well, I guess I made ahead of the majority, which is slightly different. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, I can't even imagine even today to be like an Asian American woman in politics speaking out. I mean, we have Kamala Harris as rightly the first woman of color at that sort of level. But Patsy Mink was there, you know, 1964, she ran for Congress. She was there in 1965. She was the first woman of color in Congress. She was very much ahead of her time. Mm. Yeah, and she mentioned that herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, Kimberly mentioned a book about Patsy that was aimed at young readers and also a chapter in a collection. Were there any other books or print resources that informed your research? There was one other sort of um, substantial piece of, of, of a substantial resource, and it was a, a PhD dissertation that somebody had done in the political science department of the University of Hawaii. You could search for it, it's still there, I'm sure, um, about, about Patsy. So, there, so those were the three kind of larger sources that um, I'm remembering off the top of my head. I mean, there were smaller things, but those were the three. And, and as we're talking about it though, I mean, I do wanna let people know who are interested in Patsy's life and want to know more that there is currently a book being written about her, um, a, a biography by her daughter, Gwendolyn Mink. She's co-writing it with um, a scholar, another scholar, Judy Wu. Uh, so that I was just talking to Wendy on email and that should be coming out next year. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so it's like the like official authorized <laughs> biography yeah. on Patsy Mink. Great. Um, how would you describe the relationship between Patsy Mink and Danny Noy? Did the rift heal after he switched and ran against her in 1959? I think so. I mean, people closer to them would have to answer that, right? Like when I did my interviews, it's also hard. I was interviewing people, you know, a few years after she died and they're sort of, people sometimes want to just remember the good things. And um, I don't know how candid people always were. I would ask people questions, you know, like about Patsy being treated as an outsider. And I interviewed Senator Inouye for the film. You could see that. But, um, you know, he, he wanted to say what he wanted to say. Um, it sounded like, you know, they, they got along. I mean, I'm sure there are times maybe where they didn't. But, like, for the most part, they got along. And um, they knew it was politics. Um, so I would say it did. Were there any people who declined to be interviewed? Hmm. You don't have to name them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember, maybe. <laughs> this was 13 years ago. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, there probably people were just availability wise. You know, we, we did all our filming here on Maui and DC. So if anybody was sort of outside of those centers, we didn't, we didn't get to them. Um, and then there are people we interviewed who didn't make it into the film, um, who, who I wish we could have found a way to make it into the film. But at the time, mm -hmm. I had to make some tough decisions. Yeah. For instance, um, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, I interviewed her and I didn't, she wasn't, she was not Speaker of the House at the time, but I did not um, get her interview into the film. So that would have been nice to have her in the film. Yeah. Um, how do you think this film has influenced your, your filmmaking after me. Mm. Yeah, so in looking back on the films I've made, they, there's a strong theme of films about women of color who are strong and resilient and trailblazers. So I think, um, yeah, that's just a theme. I, I don't think I set out to do that, but in looking back, you can see that from Patsy Mink to Winning Girl um, to the films I'm working on now. Even before Patsy Mink, I did a, a, a thesis film in graduate school and it was about a squad of young cheerleader, cheerleaders. So looking at gender equity through the lens of cheerleading. So yeah, the theme of gender equality, women's stories, women's empowerment um, are very much part of my work. And, and I think very much like the Patsy Mink film very much encapsulates all of that. Um, can you tell us more about the friendship between Mink and Bella Abzug? Abzug. Um, yeah, I mean, I have it in the film and I was told, yeah, they, they seemed really close there. They were kind of maybe kindred spirits in some way, but I don't, I don't know too many more details about that. 
Um, could you tell us a little bit about the next film that of yours that will be released? Okay, um, so the ones I'm working on now? Yeah, so I'm juggling a few, but the one that's um, closest to being done, it's probably still at least a year from being done, uh, is a portrait on a Samoan writer named Sia Figal. Uh, in a way, she's, you could kind of think of her as the Toni Morrison of the Pacific. She was the very first Samoan writer to write from a female perspective, to write about the lives of young adolescent girls in Samoa, and to really tackle taboo subjects like abuse, suicide, domestic violence. Um, so the film is about her, her work, but it's really also about her life and her own personal journey, which a lot of people don't know about because she does keep quite a lot of things private as many of us do. Um, and so in the past five years, she struggled with several health mental, physical health issues. And so the film is kind of following her journey of healing from those and sort of the relationship between her life and her art. So that, I hope, it, I just got to a rough cut stage and um, trying to get some completion funding for it. And hopefully we'll have it finished next year. Great, well, if you ever need a, uh, an audience to give you feedback, just let us know. <laughs> I, I might. It might actually, I'm thinking of doing some test screenings at some point. So okay. I will be in touch about that. <laughs> All right. Well, it is a little few minutes past 630 already. Um, time just flew by. Um, I would like to thank you again, Kimberly and the Hawaii Council for Humanities for putting us in touch um, and making this all happen. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And thank you for um, joining, being here with us tonight. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you for everyone who's here. I saw in the beginning, we have some folks on um, you know, the continental US and of course here in Hawaii. So for those of you who are up, you know, like 9 p.m. on the Pacific, Pacific time and later, thanks for staying up and thanks for those of you joining um, here. And if you wanna know more, you can just, you know, go to the film's website and find out more information and you can reach me through the website too. Yeah, we'll be sure to share your website in our email tomorrow. Okay, thank, thank you. you.